Hi, uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming everybody. My name is Tim Lord and I'm the Executive Director of the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee. Um, I need to speak up a little bit, is that a good idea? It just works. Okay. Uh, can anyone hear me now? Can you hear me now? Um, just a little wireless joke there, sorry. Uh, so this is um, what we're calling State of the Net West. We host this with our, our partner, St. Clara uh, Law School, the High Tech Law Institute here, um, with uh, Professor Eric Goldman. And we've been doing this for about six years now, um, trying to bridge the kind of dialogue between Washington um, and Silicon Valley and, and, and San Francisco as well, and what we do out. Um, and you know, the idea is that um, you know, both of these communities matter greatly. Washington matters to Silicon Valley, and Silicon Valley matters greatly to Washington and the overall economy for everybody. So um, it's been kind of a hard sell over the past like six or seven years trying to kind of reinforce that idea that what happens in Washington matters to you and what, what happens here in the marketplace and the valley matters back in Washington. Um, recently, you know, we've had some, um, some legislative proposals um, in Washington around intellectual property issues and a few other issues. Um, and uh, I think the idea that these, these, these communities need each other is, is resonating more and more. Um, so we're, we're thrilled this year to, to do the State of the Net West project with Santa Clara um, High Tech Law Institute. And what we plan on doing um, is bring a variety of different policymakers from Washington, mostly members of Congress, um, to here in the Valley and then perhaps up to San Francisco to kind of engage in these kind of technology town hall meetings um, with kind of the technolo technology constituents um, that Congress needs to kind of be talking to. Uh, so we'll be doing several of these throughout the year. Um, this is our first one this year. We did four last year. Um, and we hope that um, in the wake of maybe some of this um, uh, copyright legislation and kind of an awakening uh, of how, how important things are that happen in Washington are, um, we'll get more and more members to come out. Next, we have our next town hall meeting is on um, May 24th um, in Palo Alto with uh, Congressman Jason Chaffetz um, from the House Judiciary Committee, um, who played a prominent role in the kind of uh, Stop Online Piracy Act um, debate. And um, we'll be going forward with Congressman Goodlatte, who's, uh, who's uh, uh, also going to be an important player in that debate as well. Um, and also we have uh, local favorites, um, Congressman Anna Eshu and Congressman Lofgren. And then we also have, uh, for the first time, a, um, a Federal Trade Commissioner. Uh, we have uh, Federal Trade Commissioner Julie Brill uh, will be here sometime in the late summer, early fall. Um, and we'll post those, those dates as soon as we have them. Uh, Commissioner Brill uh, heads up uh, the, uh, the commission at uh, the Federal Trade Commission, and there's a tremendous amount of privacy uh, activity going on and probably going into the next Congress that will be really important for us here in the Valley in San Francisco. So um, uh, stay tuned for that. Um, I wanted to, today, you know, we're very pleased to have a local local hero, uh, Congressman Mike Honda, who is the, the co-chair of our wireless task force for the Congressional Internet Caucus. Uh, Congressman, Congressman Honda is on the Appropriations Committee and the Budget Committee, which really drive uh, fiscal policy for the United States Congress, and frankly, that's largely what it does. It's, um, fiscal policy and help drive um, some of the issues that, that you're dealing with here, here in the Valley. Uh, Congressman um, is, is beloved by just about everybody I meet. Um, I'll be in random uh, situations and they'll say, well, I am as a teacher when you're going back, or um, I, 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 he was the superintendent of my school, or things like that. So every time I, I run into somebody, uh, they always have fantastic things to say about the Congressman. Um, he, uh, he also is the is Democratic Caucus. He's the the co-chair of the New Media Working Group, so um, he, he does quite a bit on that. He's won several Golden Mouses, which is um, given out by a Washington uh, organization that kind of credits uh, members of Congress uh, for really, really good websites. It's gonna, he's got a couple of Golden Mouse awards, of which I'm sure he's um, extremely proud. So let me, look, the format for today is town hall style. Um, the congressman's gonna make some comments about uh, issues related to uh, STEM education, science, technology, and mathematics, um, and workforce development, which is really a key issue here, and also um, uh, is really driven by you know, the Congress's fiscal policy, which is kind of like a lot of fingers in. And then we'll kind of talk about maybe the legislative um, uh, developments on things like copyright, copyright policy and things like that. We have um, uh, Dana Dittmore, who's uh, from Oak Valley Consulting. He's uh, been working very much on the kind of STEM issues uh, from a nonprofit perspective over many years. Uh, and then we have Professor Eric Golden, who I mentioned earlier, who is um, uh, who has just come to a full professorship. So, what? And then once the congressman gets done with his remarks, uh, Dana and Eric are going to fill in some of the gaps, and then we'd like to, you know, uh, kind of some questions and have a town hall uh, back and forth with the congressman and, and the folks up here. So, let me introduce Congressman Mike Conley. Thank you, Tim. Can you hear me? It feels like church. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always back. 
back there and nobody's up here. <laughs> We're not going to ask you to give up the spirit or the soul. Or the you can hear me okay? Okay. Um, I just want to thank all of you for coming here to the kickoff meeting. 2012 State of the Met West. You know, punctuation is really important for me because when I read stuff, I run all the letters to get the words together. But sometimes I really don't know what I'm reading. <laughs> uh, Santa Clara University is probably one of the foremost uh, uh, institutions of learning that uh, I've really grown to uh, appreciate. And uh, just as you tell uh, uh, President in here, uh, I thought he was good to miss my first name. <laughs> 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 That's the only Santa Clara guy's name. Uh, I told him that if I was going to be if I were going to be a Catholic, I'd be a Jesuit Catholic. And uh, it's, it's really good to be here. Believe me, we're looking for a, a productive discussion that can really drive the conversation in D.C. When I first ran for Congress uh, 13 years ago, I, I asked people in technology, in the, in the area of technology, what is the role of Congress and you know, what should be my role? They said, stay out of the way. And in those days, stay out of the way meant that every time you guys get involved, bad things happen to us. There's been more things we have to worry about because you don't know what you're doing. You don't understand what you're doing. Things like when Enron happened and people came up with some solution about that's just oxy uh, they had the traditional corporate structure in mind rather than how corporate structures are here or how startups are developed. And so, you know, it wasn't as efficient as it could have been. Uh, so, you know, this area, West, really needs to have uh, a greater presence and influence in what happens in Washington, D.C. Your next um, round table with Zoe Lofgren and Anna Eshu, they're, they're uh, one of the first folks that did things in the area of digital, uh, digital signatures and making those things legal. So I, I think that um, this kind of uh, forum and this kind of get together it is going to be really important because the key thing about policy is that we have to know what we're doing. Kind of what you're doing. Uh, policy thing. <coughs> and we should have staff that knows more than policy makers. Um, and that's why you know, when you look at offices, scan your office and find out who's there, what their background is, and those kinds of things. And you know, how much do they really understand about things that you care about. You know, Tim keeps a constant eye on me. And you know, and then he he sifts through all my staff and says, Oh, okay, they they they, they meet snuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just want to uh, say thank you to Tim. Joy was not here tonight and Eric and particularly been instrumental making today walk without a hitch. And on time. I want to thank um, Professor full Professor Eric Coleman who will talk about <laughs> intellectual property and then uh, David Dittmar who will talk about education and workforce issues, which is really something that's close to my heart, especially the issue of equity across education. So I just want to, let's give them a round of applause. For <laughs> As a former classroom teacher, I always felt the most productive sessions occur when there is a two-way dialogue and conversation. So uh, I'm going to be brief and then sit down this if you want to listen to a conversation. <clears throat> speak on and on and on, you can turn to C-SPAN. So uh, over the past six months, Congress has been uh, um, been in debates and taken action on several critical issues that's really important to Silicon Valley. Some of them, like the recent Spectrum Auction Agreement last month, have potential to drive innovation and in our region forward into the 21st century. I was proud to support this agreement. I was particularly heartened uh, to see that the unlicensed Spectrum provisions are included for a lot of reasons, especially as an educator. Other issues like the Stop Online Pir Piracy Act, or SOPA. When I first heard SOPA, I thought it was a Portuguese word for food. <laughs> SOPA, as it is popular thought, would have a, had a profound effect on how the internet functions on a basic level. I strongly oppose this bill, went so far as to black out my own website in protest. If SOPA had passed, it would have set dangerous precedent and represented a big uh, step backwards in Washington's efforts to foster growth in the digital sector. Thankfully, SOPA has been taken off the table for now, 
but attempt to limit the internet will not stop. Okay, now taking a long view, I also believe that Congress has a responsibility to look at the workforce pipeline that will educate and train interviewers tomorrow. How many of you are law students or students or graduate students or undergraduate students here at Santa Clara? Watch that corner. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you are first generation from your families uh, in the University How many of you was born outside of this country? How many of you speak another language other than English? Good. So we have uh, pretty much of a globalized uh, audience here. So often uh, the focus of our national spotlight is the lack of jobs available to folks in this country. And with your background and your understanding about language, um, immigration, things like that, a lot of things about immigration and education and high technology, the workforce, H1B, all those things, you should be dipping into your own experience and ask yourself, is this the most, is this the most elegant policy possible based upon what, what I understand my experiences to be? A lot of times we forget to use our own things our own experiences to translate that into analysis and uh, policy. So for many technology companies here, the problem is just the opposite, not a lack of jobs, but plenty of jobs, but no one to fill the, the necessary skills uh, and, and to be qualified and to be hired. And why is this? Part of the reason is that our education system is not producing classroom environments where, where critical thinking and problem-based learning is valued, and I hope that this will be touching on that. Students don't have to have the necessary skills to thrive in university and career and, and, and technical colleges, but they, I think that all students should have the skills of critical thinking and scientific inquiry. So American students are not producing high marks on international benchmarks, tested science and mathematics education, and we're being out-competed in global education. I have some thoughts about that whether we really should worry about that or not. The key is time on task. I mean, if, we're, if we're asked questions about that, I'd be willing to, uh, talk, to talk to them. To counteract this kind of a dilemma, I have introduced a bill, the STEM, um, which is the Science, Technology, Engineering, Mathematics, Education, Innovation Act, to help keep the national focus on STEM education <coughs> so that we are building up our collective effort to develop a, a skilled American workforce. But uh, having said that, I think a lot of the focus should be pre-K, rather than only case of uh, 612. The workforce and labor issues are exacerbated by the fact that our broken immigration system is in place, which is in dire need of reform. And it makes it difficult for high-tech companies to hire skilled workers. As the author of the Reunited Families Act of Congress, I've also been extremely supportive of efforts in Washington to help skilled workers come to the United States. Through comprehensive immigration reform, or CIR, I believe that we can continue to bring talented minds to Silicon Valley, help grow the U.S. economy, and strengthen our competitiveness in the global markets, and do it in a way where we're not being mean, uh, we're not being, uh, we're not questioning people's dignity, and that we're attracting people again here to this country to participate. After all, Silicon Valley would not be Silicon Valley without the folks who immigrated here, went to school here, and established themselves here. So we have to stop vilifying uh, this whole issue of uh, immigration and start to look at people as folks who want to come here and participate. So I look forward to discussing all these issues with you here today, salt bus spectrum, STEM, and skill worker immigration. And with that, I'm happy to get started and we'll get off the program. Taking over. <laughs> 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 yeah, you need, no, you need to um, just turn. I think you might have a button that needs to be turned on. Hello, I'm Seth. Um, 
Well, first of all, thanks uh, uh, to Congressman Conrad Honda and to our host, uh, Santa Clara University, for the opportunity to participate in this program. Uh, the focus of my brief remarks today will be on the importance of STEM education to workforce development in Silicon Valley. The problem, the miracle of Silicon Valley as a center of innovation and entrepreneurship for the U.S. and the world is under serious challenge in my view. Why? Because there is a growing shortage of domestically educated, qualified engineers in Silicon Valley and the U.S. The U.S. now ranks 31st among wealthy nations in terms of percentage of high school students at an advanced level of math achievement. Surprisingly also, less than 50% of 12th graders meet the math proficiency benchmark for college readiness. And, perhaps corollary to this, there has been a steady decline over the past 40 years in the percentage of U.S. college graduates choosing to earn science, math, and or engineering undergraduate degrees. The root cause, K-12 STEM education, which provides the foundation for university entrance and ultimate graduation with science, math, and or engineering degrees, is not meeting the need. There is a shortage of fully qualified K-12 STEM teachers with the result that underprepared teachers with general credentials are pressed into service to teach math and, and, uh, and STEM subjects. It is difficult for underprepared teachers, no matter how well the teachers, to inspire young people and effectively teach STEM subjects. And there are also limited opportunities for K-12 students to develop their critical thinking and problem-solving skills in the, in the school environment with the curriculum offered. My view, the solution is uh, to increase our focus on STEM education in the U.S., specifically K-12 STEM education. Uh, you know, many of you may be familiar with uh, a study that was done this, this, uh, initiated by the National Academies of Science, um, and, and, and the, the report was uh, entitled, Rising Above the Gathering Storm. And um, the primary first recommendation out of this study uh, was that we must increase America talent pool by vastly improving K-12 science and math education. That's the bottom line. There are two programs, and I want, I want to, with, out of respect for Santa Clara University and wonderful institution it is, I want to uh, prepare you for the fact that I'm going to mention one other university here in the Valley, uh, and that's San Jose State University. And, and the reason for it, it is also a wonderful university, but it is the source of uh, more than 50% of the of K-12 teachers in Silicon Valley, uh, and therefore uh, there are a couple of programs going on there that I think are pivotal in the solution to our K-12 STEM education problems. The first is San Jose State Center for STEM Education. It provides specialized focus on STEM education at the university level for teacher and student preparation and for existing teacher professional development to get their skills to where they need to be so they are better prepared to teach the STEM subjects. The second program is Project Lead the Way. And many of you may have heard of Project Lead the Way. It is being led in Northern California by San Jose State College of Engineering. This program provides middle school and high school students with a unique opportunity to develop their foundation in STEM by working together in teams to solve technical problems and develop product ideas. And this is in middle school and high school. It's project-based. And in fact, when it is adopted in schools, it becomes a systemic part of the curriculum. There are now almost 40 schools in Silicon Valley uh, that, that have this program, thanks to the leadership of the College of Engineering at San Jose State over the last uh, approximately three years. There are 3,500 schools across the U.S. that now have this program. Bottom line for me is we don't need to develop new solutions to these problems. We need to get our emphasis and resource behind 
two proven programs that will help to provide the necessary focus and training on STEM education for teachers and students. Uh, let us take a challenge. Let's move us from 31st in the world to 10th in the world at, at the advanced uh, level of math achievement by the year 2020. And let's have Silicon Valley lead the way. Thank you. So let's just switch gears a little bit. Uh, have, have as well we talk about some copyright issues and kind of the legislative uh, discussions over uh, the Stop Online Piracy Act, as Congress mentioned. Then we'll go into some some Q and A on both STEM and copyright, if that's okay. Um, I know uh, the, leg or the legislation um, it's kind of new at this point. We, we don't see it rising from the dead anytime soon. Um, so the actual legislation itself may not be as interested in the process, um, where at, whereby you know Silicon Valley got engaged, other folks got engaged. Um, and people from San Francisco got engaged. Um, uh, really, it is probably what would be really interesting and can have the Congressman's perspective on that too. Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, okay, good. Um, so, uh, first of all, thank you all for coming here. Uh, the State of the Northwest program is uh, an essential uh, part of our permanent offering for the year. Um, and working with uh, people like Tim and uh, his the staff and with the members of Congress and their staff is a joy and we're grateful for the opportunity to do so. Um, we're especially grateful to Representative Honda for all the work that he does for San Diego University across the board and for being here today. Um, and I want to give a shout out to uh, Representative Honda for his leadership on the online copyright battles that we had over the last uh, year or so. Um, for, both for his early opposition to the legislation and for blacking out his website and signaling to the world uh, how deeply he felt about uh, the issues that Congress was um, uh, debating. Uh, the fact that uh, he took such a radical step in how he sent his messages to his constituents of the world, I thought was a real signal that um, uh, both his passion but also of the importance of the matter. Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that is the only time you blacked out your website. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it showed that this was not an ordinary uh, Congress just doing business uh, as usual type of uh, issue. It was uh, a muscle. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? You'll get the, the, the SCU uh, Golden uh, uh, Principled Stance Award. How about that? <laughs> um, no, we, we, uh, what happened on January 18th when uh, the legislation, I think for all intents and purposes, died, um, was really a remarkable day. Um, the, the stakes uh, at issue were high. Um, we were talking about ways that we would uh, deputize additional party to become the copyright police. And uh, those uh, people who would become the copyright police might not have the incentive that we would expect them to have. If we were trying to maximize social welfare, they might be captured or otherwise motivated to preserve their own self-interest and not the interests of the public at large. Um, and so uh, the, the stakes were high because uh, we had the capacity, potentially, with the legislation to change the fundamental architecture of the internet. We don't really understand why the internet works the way it does. There's something magical about the invisible hand and the uh, ways that people choose to opt into the internet um, and uh, participate in their own rational self-interest, at least to some greater good. And um, we have the potential with the legislation to change that secret sauce in very critical ways. Um, to undo uh, that invisible hand that uh, we all uh, choose to um, participate in the uh, internet and uh, make it so that uh, the participation would not be um, uh, as seamless or potentially not even possible at all. Um, so uh, what happened on January 18th was, uh, I think, uh, a first in, in so many ways. But what happened is the content owner lobby was defeated on on a fair fight. In other words, then you know, had uh, they were fighting hard, uh, opponents are fighting hard, and the competitors lost. And it's very hard to point to any other example in history where the copyright owners have lost on a fair fight. Um, and I think that's really a, a, a remarkable um, outcome, something that we're deconstructing to today. I know that uh, over the next several years we'll be having thousands of academic articles. What happened on January 18th? Why did it work or why didn't it work and what should we do differently? Um, but uh, you know, think about it as the heavyweight uh, champion, uh, undefeated in a title bout, got knocked out. Um, unbelievable to have that kind of outcome. Um, but the news is not good. Um, you know, there was a, uh, a, a, a victory in the, the first skirmish, but the battle is hardly over. Um, 
And what I'm seeing is that the content owners who, who suffered their first knockout blow on January 18th said, okay, we don't like that fight. Let's take the fight to other uh, venues where we can win. Um, so what we're seeing is that the content owners are taking the battle anywhere but Congress. They're taking it to the international treaties. And as we know, there are discussions about things like ACTA or the TPP. These are proposals where um, through international discussions, um, uh, the content owners can try and handcuff uh, the United States and get exactly what they were trying to argue for in, uh, uh, in the legislative battle. Um, the content owners can go to the Department of Justice and say, you've got criminal copyright enforcement powers, go crack some skulls. And we saw that the next day with the mega upload prosecution where uh, mega upload putatively qualifies for the existing safe harbors, at least for some of their activity, and they're still facing a major criminal prosecution. Um, the content owners are going to the court, uh, and uh, we've been documenting on my blog uh, case after case where the content owners are getting the same kind of relief that they were asking for in the legislation. So whether we pass new law or not, if the revenues are the same, what are we fighting about? Um, and then finally I'll point out that uh, the content owners are taking it to uh, the industry, and they're asking the industry to do their dirty work without any legislative compulsion. So, for example, uh, there's the uh, graduated response, uh, voluntary, and I put that in quote, the voluntary, because we're holding gun to your head type of um, uh, a deal that uh, the internet access providers have struck, where they're going to be the content owner's police. They're going to kick people off the internet because uh, they uh, think that uh, those individuals are infringing. Um, what this takes to me is that uh, as great as a job as uh, um, uh, we all did, I think, in uh, uh, fighting the battle uh, on January 18th, um, what it shows to me is that if what we really need is proactive legislation um, in, uh, from Congress that actually ensures some of the rights that we take for granted, that we don't need to scuttle bills that just preserve when we scuttle them, just preserve the status quo, what we need are more safe harbors and immunities coming from Congress that not only preserve uh, the uh, playing field uh, as we want it to be, um, but make sure that none of these unround, end around run work, that they actually keep the courts from doing what we don't want them to do, or keep the voluntary industry organizations from doing things that we don't want to do, or uh, uh, deflect uh, some of the efforts of uh, these international treaties. So um, I put out the challenge to Congress that if they want to, may actually make the difference now. The next step is for them to actually go proactively guarantee our rights as users and consumers of the internet, um, not simply uh, scuttle bills that would have taken those away. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so now I'm going to tell you how I really feel. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I ask you a question? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, do, you, do you want to do you have a, a broken mic? No, I don't. Well, I, I don't. But, um, <laughs> Um, so, I mean, you were talking about the graduated response, memorandum of understanding between the ISPs and the content community. Um, are you saying that that is not a positive development um, in the light that, it was, as far as we can tell, um, is largely voluntary? It's largely if you working together to address a problem. Um, and so far, no, no ISPs have said they'd actually terminate anyone's service. Is that, you know, would, is that a, a good outcome in light of the fact that it could have been legislative, uh, like Adobe in France or, or El uh, London in legislation in Hong Kong as well? So I'm kind of curious about your... Yeah, so in 1998, Congress enacted the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and as part of that enacted 17 U.S.C. 512A that said that internet access providers are not liable for infringement that takes place over their network. Um, this is different from web hosts or other types of intermediaries, but internet access providers are not liable for copyright infringement. That law is very clear. Um, and yet, the same internet access providers have entered into an agreement with content owners to go and police their network and terminate or otherwise degrade the subscription rights of their consumers um, voluntarily. Now, why would the internet access providers choose to do that if they already had legislative protection that said they weren't liable in the first place? Now, one answer is that they are trying to actually act as good Samaritans. They're trying to clean up the internet. Another is that something funny is going on, and I think there's a number of uh, hypotheses, what kind of funny things might be going on, I'm happy to explore them if you want. Um, the problem with the, the, uh, the, this book, Voluntary Solution, is that it, it doesn't build in the legislative protections that we expect as consumers. 
So for example, there's a series of iterative steps of discipline that the internet access providers have agreed upon uh, to um, uh, uh, punish uh, uh, rogue subscribers. Um, those procedures don't follow standard due process. Um, they, the, there's an uh, expedited adjudicative process um, that uh, doesn't come anywhere close to the kinds of standards we would expect that can lead to the termination of someone's internet access uh, account. Now, we haven't seen that as the final uh, outcome. Uh, I don't know why we would have any other solution than termination, so I continue to believe that's going to be the ultimate payoff. We'll have to see about that. Um, so, uh, so the lack of due process is a serious problem. The other problem is that there's no transparency into the process whatsoever. We don't get the kind of stats to see what kinds of algorithms are automatically detecting that someone's engaged in copyright infringement, or what kinds of outcomes are gonna occur in this process. All this takes place in a big black box. Remember, all this is in contrast to what would have happened under default rules as enacted by Congress, 17 U.S.C. 512A, that says that if the content owners objected to these subscribers' uh, activity, they could have sued the Internet Access providers. They would have sued the individuals in court. And in court, then, we would have had transparency. We would have seen what those cases look like. And we would have also had all the standard due process that we expect from our judicial system. That's why I object to the quote voluntary agreement. Uh, did you notice that um, the advisory board for the, the copyright um, MOU group um, was was just announced? And, um, my my boss, Jerry Berman, uh, was on the that advisory council. As is G.D. Sun, does that give you any any uh, feel better about that? Yeah. So uh, the uh, board, uh, I'm sorry. The uh, there's a new organization that's designed to act as the coordinator of all this activity, um, and that organization has a series of governing bodies. One of them is a advisory board of external constituents. Um, that appointed some real leaders in our field, people like uh, Gigi, uh, people like uh, Jerry Berman, people like Jules uh, Pol uh, Polanski. Polanski. Uh, um, people uh, who uh, have done a lot of good work on behalf of consumers. Um, someone like Gigi is not easily uh, uh, bought off, for example. Um, I'm guessing she'll be throwing punches. Uh, my concern is, however, that the advisory board has given no real power in dictating any of the problems that I have. They can't ensure due process. They cannot ensure transparency. They will get a voice at the table, but to what effect, we are unsure. So the fact that they appointed, I think, a robust board is a good step, but it doesn't actually fix the underlying structure. Can I, can I ask a, a question to the congressman? And I'll exhaust all my questions. I apologize. Um, on, 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 on your STEM you know, proposal, and specifically uh, immigration reform, um, out here it seems like there's just broad consensus that we should have H-1B visas and STEM, STEM visas for um, it, you know, high-skilled high workers and uh, engineering students and things like that. But in Washington, you know, I, in your bio, I, I forgot to mention that you're, a, you're for your caucus, for the Democratic caucus, you're a, you're a senior whip. Um, and it, it's common knowledge in Washington that um, the H-1B visa, the STEM visa issue, seems to be held up by the larger debate over immigration reform. So it, it seems like it's hard to get any specific um, like H-1B high-tech uh, visa proposal through unless the entire immigration reform goes through, which is, is sort of holding up um, one of your major initiatives. And you know, as a leader in the Democratic caucus, can you kind of explain that and what your hopes are for maybe getting around that kind of larger uh, all-or-nothing approach? Well, the <clears throat> good question, by the way. Thank you. And that's what you asked. Um, I think the H-1B and STEM should be all part of the outcome of a comprehensive immigration reform act. Um, in the past, what we've done is we piecemeal a lot of our policies and, and patchwork it. And so we end up with Frankenstein. Um, and when we were working on the comprehensive immigration reform act about four or five years ago, we determined, we meaning the, the caucus, the Latino caucus, uh, some members of the Asian caucus and the African American caucus, the black caucus, the progressive caucus. We felt that if we allow the immigration issue to be piecemeal through, the easy stuff gets through. Or the easy stuff that has a lot of popularity in certain sectors, or have a lot of um, uh, special interest groups that have a lot of sway on Congress will get through. And then the rest of the stuff, the hard stuff, like how do you deal with uh, the undocumented population, the illegal population, 
what does the undocumented population look like? Are they folks who came with new sites and then allowed them to expire? Um, and all these kinds of things would not be addressed or solved. Um, and I, I think that the only compromise that we came up with was with the Dream Act kids. Um, that they were on the, in terms of the list of uh, priorities, uh, in terms of uh, wanting to keep them, they were high on the list. The, the, in terms of them being the most problematic, the Dream Act case was the least pro problematic. Um, and so that was a compromise that we wanted to put out there and to have considered uh, given the politics of uh, comprehensive immigration reform. H-1B is a solution to a problem that's um, that's been spread out to a lot of different areas. And um, and I, I support H-1B visa if we can move uh, it towards a, a better uh, system where those who are H-1B visa holders have some options before they just had limited options. They had very, very um, tight regulations in terms of who's the sponsor. The sponsor decided that they don't need them anymore, they're gone. Um, there's no portability in there. So there's a lot of things that were problematic for me in the beginning. And I sort of looked at it as, as if it were a high-tech cooling <coughs> system where we brought in workers that was cheaper, skilled, and necessary, but only for a certain amount of time. And it's a harsh terminology, but it was my background uh, as an Asian American in this country and in the state. I understand how people can be used for the purposes of the economic uh, viability. Um, on, on the STEM, it's important, but I think it needs to be extended to pre K, um, and, and not only 6 to 12. Because I'm concerned about the youngsters that fall out, that spin out, that lose interest in, um, in science because we haven't figured out how to let them know that no matter what their background is or the situation, they're doing science every day. We just don't put the science terminology in what they do, like oil and egg. You change the state of water, you change, you're denaturizing uh, the proteins in an egg, but they don't say it that way, it says I'm oil and egg. And, and if they understood that that was all science, then they might be able to feel like they can do these kinds of things and not feel outside so language in instruction is important. Now, the overall comprehensive immigration reform has implications in every walk of life in our country. Uh, there's part of it is the Reuniting Families Act, where we have citizens who are applying for re reunification with their loved ones. And sometimes they have to wait 20 years before they can get it. And if the immigration office loses the paper, it's not their fault. It's the applicant's fault, and they got to re refile again and get to the end of the line. Some wait 10, 20 years, and then when their, when their, their um, minor children become adults, then they got to do it all over again. And the only thing I added to the Reuniting Families Act was to make sure that it was truly comprehensive. What I mean by that is to add to the platform another plank, and those are binational, same gender couples and their families. And that would make it truly comprehensive. But that would be a hard one to pass if it were not all in, in, inside of a complete package. So that's why you know, I'm, I'm sticking to a larger comprehensive package that we really hammer out all these things so that it will be a document and a process that we'd be proud of. If our immigration system were um, a, a, um, a store like um, clothing store, we certainly would be, we would not have a reputation like Nordstrom's or Neiman Marcus, you know, where the customer's right to exchange your materials without question. And so that, that's the point where we have to get at put the politics aside and just really hammer out a good policy for people. Long answer, sorry. I'd like to, if I could, offer a few comments, but, ah, there we go. I'm just gonna, you know, use, use it this way. Um, but first of all, uh, having spent um, almost 40 years in uh, 
in the high tech industry in, in Silicon Valley uh, and have, have uh, been a hirer, if you will, an employer of, of uh, a large number of, uh, of uh, employees from outside the US when we were faced with the dilemma that there were no there weren't, there weren't sufficient available degreed engineers to hire and let, you know, accept the, H1, the ones under H-1B visa. And I can guarantee you, they were hired under the same compensation structure as every other employee. We did not have two compensation structures. We treated these employees like all of our other employees and we benefited from their creativity and ultimately, most or many of them became green card and then ultimately citizens of the United States. The other thing that's really important for us to keep in mind on immigration, I think, is, is that the miracle of Silicon Valley, certainly driven by K-12 education, has been also driven by this great source of immigrant talent that has come in and started companies and led companies and led divisions of existing companies. So we are enriched in this country by constructive immigration and this Silicon Valley is this diverse Silicon Valley is an, you know as an example of that so I, I think it's really important we don't forget that the, the other thing I'd like to briefly comment on is it's not SOPA and uh, but it is intellectual property protection the US and US companies are under attack continually from competitors outside this country who are both customers and then become competitors because they start copying products and so on and so forth. And we really need to have strong emphasis in legislation and enforcement uh, and prevent products coming into this U.S. that in fact are copies or the result of copied technology, you know, second generation that, that end up undermining the competitiveness of U U.S. companies and effectively taking jobs out of this country. So those are two things that I, I think that, that are really important to industry. I see it all the time. I'm still active. I consult for a number of high-tech companies and intellectual property protection against uh, foreign national companies, some very, very large companies that I won't name, uh, and enforcement of intellectual property protection is uh, just extremely difficult and even in those countries they have laws that mimic the US IP protection and enforcement laws and then when you get into the courts to protect your IP it somehow gets thrown out or nothing or nothing happens in the, in the courts in, in the country in question uh, so we have serious problems in that area separate from k-12 education you know I'm a proponent of k-12 stem education uh, it, you know, it is so important to our future, and it applies to minorities, it applies to majorities, it applies to all of our diverse population. We need to strengthen STEM education so that we can continue the miracle of Silicon Valley and continue to have this be the center of entrepreneurship and innovation in the world. H-1B program for STEM teachers. Uh, but let, let me just go back to the, the phrase, uh, don't make perfection the enemy of the good. Um, I get it. I get it. But how long are we going to keep from addressing the real problem? That's you know, to fix the problem in its, in its entirety. And if Congress can't get it and understand it, and they use policies and politics and fear, uh, you know, I don't put up with that. I went through it as, as a community and as a country. 
I've seen this country go through periods of fear, fear mongering, and trying to develop different kinds of policies. And, and I think that that's all part of the politics today. You know, we focus on the border. Has anybody been at the border and understand what's going on? We got more law enforcement in Nogal, the Los Dos Nogales. They're the safest place because they got so many law enforcement forces. You know, it's between the urban areas where it's dangerous. Um, stem cell, you know, education is, is really basic in this country, but is it equitable? Why are we have 50 states battling every year over a budget, and when they balance the budget, it's over education. Who's victimized? Parents, teachers, and most of all, our clients, the youngsters. Now, the report that gathering, uh, Rising Above the Gathering Storm was mentioned. There's no one before that, you know, a nation at risk. And the, the two had the same kinds of outcomes, you know. But there's always one silver lining in those reports. The nation at risk said, if any country came to this country and imposed a mediocre uh, education system, we would consider that an act of war. Well, we don't have to worry about other countries. We're doing it to ourselves. And Khrushchev said, that, I don't have to attack you, you're gonna just implode. I don't think he thought about that, but essentially, we are deteriorating in, uh, in, internally. And the, the lack of science teachers, um, and lack of uh, STEM, uh, STEM kids, it's, it's, uh, it's the adults that need to understand that this is necessary, that we have to invest in our country. And we have to start with STEM, stand back and ask ourselves, is it good policy to have the states have the sole responsibility of education just because it's said in the Constitution? What the Constitution says, that which is not explicit shall be the purview of the states. It didn't say exclusivity. It didn't say uh, anything that, you know, that it excluded the, uh, the federal government because at that time there was no education uh, system. Commerce, post office, the military, all those things existed because that was the state of the art. Until Carter came along and said, we're gonna have something here. So um, we have to grow up and mature at the same time as policy makers and stop stop fighting among ourselves because our kids, their civil rights are being violated. And the only thing they have, only thing that kids have to spend when they go to school, the only currency they have is time. You can't bank it and withdraw later with interest. It's spent. Now every parent and every adult in this country should be alarmed and angry about that. But it's not the kids' fault. It's not immigrants' fault. It's not poor people's fault. It's policymakers who don't understand the question, why are there poor schools in poor neighborhoods? How do you, how do you create communities? What are those things that drive those things ultimately? We try desegregation, now we're resegregated. So therefore, something is missing. It's the issue of equity for each child. So I think in education, in STEM especially, we have to start talking in policy language. Instead of saying, all children deserve an equal rights, an equal opportunity in education in this country. We should say each child has a right to equitable education according to their needs. Solutions that will change women. So it's a challenge I think that we all have and, and not looking at outside and figuring out it must be that, it must be this, you know. I understand that we're behind in competition with other countries, but they spend more time per day on instruction and how much do we spend. So there's a lot of things that we have to look at, at ourselves first. Um, sorry. Hello, my name is Gabrielle Zaccarelli. I'm from Santa Clara Law. Um, this question is for the Congressman, building off of what you just said. Um, you know, implementing STEM in K through 12 is clearly going to cost um, quite a bit of money, I'm assuming, um, in science and math that requires materials, books, um, items for laboratory testings, all of that. So, you know, I come from Arizona originally and talking about um, the legislature being difficult. Welcome to California. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And so with that said, um, you know, how does 
DC see this in seeing that there are state legislatures that don't support education? And how is, you know, these huge budget cuts that are going towards through K through 12, how is that going to impact how we are effectively, you know, implementing STEM in the future? And how do we, you know, get the message across? I was a former lobbyist, a uh, student lobbyist with, you know, the Arizona legislature, and, you know, there were people there who didn't want to hear anything we had to say in regards to education. So how do we get the message across? Yeah. I'll, I'll let the, him speak after I, I'll be brief. Solving the education problem is expensive. Um, but if we're going to look at mediocrity, and if mediocrity were imposed by another country on us, would be considered an act of war, then we should be at in battle. I, I don't like the word war in terms of kids and education, but the proposition I'm suggesting that each child's uh, um, needs should be addressed rather than all children would change the solution set, but it's going to be expensive. But not much more expensive than going to war in Iraq and in, in, in Afghanistan, where we have spent a trillion dollars in, in, in servicing that debt of $800 billion. That's enough one to get started in changing the concept. If all children can learn, then children in Appalachia and Beverly Hills should have the same opportunity. They may have different issues, but they should have the same opportunity. And if we believe in equal rights, then we should believe in equity for each child in education. And that's an investment we have to make. The bumper sticker says, what is the price of ignorance? And we see it every year in every legislature. I really, uh, I really, I'm really a supporter of, of, of Congressman Honda and the initiative that he's driven on STEM education. And I, mean, I really think he's such a right thinker in this area. Um, but I think we need a bridge. And the bridge is corporations need to help us with this problem. And, um, and in, in the case of Project Lead the Way, Project Lead the Way in Silicon Valley, We've got over a million dollars in commitments for Project Lead the Way from corporations. Corporations like Xilinx and KLA Tencor and others. Similarly, uh, the STEM Education Center in San Jose State has corporate sponsors and we have almost a million dollars in commitments. And so industry needs to help bridge, but we need to change our stat tax structure. You know, we failed our students, I voted for, check for for Proposition 13 back in, in the late 70s, really. I don't even remember what year it was. I damn myself every day for that. We went from 78, thank you, Mike. We went from being in the top 10 states in the country on dollars spent per K-12 student each year, and we're something like 48th now. We have you know, committed a grave, you know, disservice to our to our young people. And for me, why am I in this? I'm in it for my grandkids. You know, I want them to have the same opportunity I did because I grew up in California at a time when we were in the top ten in the country. So industry has to help with a bridge, but government needs to change the tax structure so that we funnel the education resources where they need to be. Hi, Joyce Cutler, I'm a reporter for BNA. I want to go back to the days of the DMCA when it was first passed. And the, the many bright minds were concerned that the DMCA would be used as a bludgeon against people. And I'm wondering, since we haven't really fixed the problems of the DMCA, specifically how it's being used uh, against people for, for creativity, how that works with protecting intellectual property now. Specifically, um, if we can't fix what was passed many years ago, how do we fix it now? Guys, I'm not totally clear on uh, where oh. you're, you're going. I mean, I, I could go on and on with the deficiencies of the uh, online safe harbors and 17 U.S.C. 512. Well, it's, it's about how people are using the DMCA for it's what was not intended purposes. Yeah. Can you give me a paradigmatic example that's on your mind? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of like uh, the, the, the many times that the Prime Frontier Foundation has to send letters for uh, to, to companies that are threatening people for using 
uh, company names and, as, as a trademark violation when it's just in free speech matters, let's say on blogs or wherever? Yeah, although trademark isn't covered by 17 U.S.C. 512, so that um, sometimes we do see people who uh, misuse the uh, 17 U.S.C. 512 C3 takedown procedures um, to that are designed to cover copyright complaints, and they use it for trademark purposes. We've definitely seen that. Um, but you know, um, let's step back for a moment. Um, I, I've said many critical things of the balance of the struck in 1998 and the online safe harbor. Um, but the reality is that it has not been a, a fatal impediment to the development of the user-generated content community. Now, some companies have gotten driven out of the industry by the misuse of uh, the tools in the safe harbor. And so, for example, uh, my paradigmatic example of that is Bio, uh, which what the Ninth Circuit said was eligible for 17 U.S.C. 512C protection, and uh, yet uh, the corporate owners were able to bleed it dry with legal fees and kicked it out of the marketplace nonetheless. So it was legal, but still dead. Um, that's, not, that's, I think, a good misuse situation. But overall, if you, look, if you step back, I mean, we've had an enormous amount of uh, entrepreneurial activity in the user-generated content space um, predicated on the assumption that there's a notice and takedown scheme. If there's uh, problems with copyright infringement material on the site, that the copyright owners will communicate that to the site. The site will respond expeditiously. And that balance has led to the ability of people to make investments. And that was one of the main things that was at risk in the SOPA proposal, is that there was bypasses to that notice and takedown scheme. There wasn't going to be uh, the same opportunity for a website to fix the problem uh, that they had under the current uh, solution. So um, I guess, Joyce, I'm, I'm still stuck on your predicate assumption. Um, I'd love to fix a lot of the problems with uh, the DMC online safe harbors, um, but to me, the more pressing need is to fix some of the things that we're seeing in these other battlegrounds. Um, that, uh, that the DMCA has worked effectively enough to make it so that people could do what we want them to do. Um, but I, I'm not sure that's so responsive to you, but I'm curious uh, if you have thoughts about the two. I'll, I'll um, speak in the context of uh, my own experience and my own understanding. Um, I, I guess when people are looking for solutions uh, for policymakers, uh, I would really shudder, and you should be watching us very carefully because a lot of us don't understand what the hell you just said. <laughs> you know? And then we're going to pretend that we knew, and then we're going to try and fix it. And uh, you end up with a mess. Uh, that's why in the beginning when I said, when I asked people, you know, what's the role of the policymaker, they just you know, stay out of our way. But the real answer should have been, we need to get together. We, you need to understand what we do, and you need to understand how it's done, uh, how things get done in, in, um, in uh, Congress or any policymaking level. So um, there's a lot of educating for all of you who are thought leaders. And thought leaders are going to have to really become, I think, conceptually broader in your thinking so that everything you do within that concept will start start to make sense. When we start to solve problems you know, in, in different areas, it creates other problems in other areas. And I think we just got to get past this, this linear thinking and, and become more conceptual and web-like in our thinking. Um, and having said that, um, it sort of brought to mind, I said kiddingly uh, uh, once, that the problem that the Native Americans had in this country is they had no concept of land ownership. So when Europeans came over, even if the Asians came over, they had a concept of land ownership, and that determined class and everything else like that. The sharing of land and the stewardship of land was a foreign concept to Asia and to Europe but not to those who are here. And when those two clashes, uh, someone loses, and we know who lost. And so I think that we, we need to start to understand and conceptualize, is there due process? You know, is there transparency? The things that uh, Eric had brought up, you know, these kinds of things are necessary in policy making so that we take care of uh, people and we take care of the consumer, and right now, uh, we forget sometimes the consumer and we make decisions in, in Congress based upon who has the most influence. 
And a lot of times it's about market share, not about consumer protection. <clears throat> Let me bring it back to the STEM education question, but slightly different angle. It strikes me that there's an aspect of the STEM education problem that we've been not talking about at all, and that is actually fundamental science funding and the role of science in our society. When I was growing up, I know when Dana was growing up, science was the sexy thing. It was the next frontier. I mean, that was where we were all going to, that was what drove our curiosity as kids, and we pursued it. Today, there's a war on science among the policymakers. There's denial of science, there's cutting the funding of science, there's cutting the funding of major engineering programs. The role of federal government in funding curiosity-driven or speculative R&D has been reduced. And I worry that we could hope all we want to that we can improve the STEM education system, but if kids aren't drawn into science, if they don't see the opportunity, if they aren't excited by the, the, the choices, the curiosity, we're not going to drive them there. What can we do to educate our policymakers, because I think it is an education process, and to get them to better understand the importance of science and the scientific method, if you will, in our 21st century society? I guess that's to me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm prejudiced, okay? Um, you don't have to change the policymakers. If they, if they don't understand, they don't, they don't learn, you got to change them. But because in Congress they come from people elect them, so maybe there's got to be a, a, a more basic education in terms of how do you bring it home to folks who are pushing, putting policymakers who are there against their own self-interest, against the self-interest of their children's children, seven generations now. I mean, coming here this morning, I was listening to the demise of polar bears, there's 25,000 left. Some people say that's a whole lot of bears. And you know, it was all centered around the ice melt in, in, in the Arctic. And um, so we have to really have a, a major uh, push in making you know, everybody understand the severity of not having a good understanding of uh, what's going on, what we're doing to our own environment now. If the Chinese are doing it, then why are they doing it? I mean, yeah, they're, they're polluting, but at the same time, they're doing, they're trying to make corrective stuff. So, um, you know, they must, they must understand something. Now, we don't have a national policy that drives the entire country forward on uh, global warming. In South Korea, when I was there, they made a statement, green growth, and everybody at every level uh, was uh, moving on it. In our country, um, we have a lot of self-interest and we forgot about our, our, our responsibility to, to the whole um, community and the whole globe. It's like pretending that this globe was the spaceship enterprise. You know? We have a certain principle that we're gonna operate by and we haven't gotten to it yet. And, uh, so, I didn't answer your question, but I, I think that it's going to be an issue of uh, educating folks. Uh, maybe, maybe this way. In the 50s, we did not know there were states that existed that had policies about separate but equal. It was working there, but the rest of the country didn't know until TV came along and we started seeing <coughs> the atrocities and, and, and the kinds of way people are being treated and how they're being pounded down. It's the issue of power and control. And when we still, when the rest of the country and the world saw it through TV, we became incensed. So it drove our politicians through public will to change it. And when, when Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act, he said, we're gonna lose the Democrats from the South. And he was right, but he did the right thing. So maybe it's it's about you know each one reach one each one teach one and getting back to the old mantra of the sixties. So. Uh, Mark, thanks for your question. I, you know, one of the things that strikes me about uh, public office, and I have great respect for people like uh, Senator, you know, Congressman Honda, who's devoted his life to public service. But when we started our corporate life, Mark, the first thing our corporation did was put us in a training program. 
taught us how to be good engineers, and ultimately they taught us how to be managers and what have you. And uh, I don't see any evidence at at the local, state, or federal level that we uh, put our new uh, uh, congress congressmen, senators, what have you, into training programs to learn their job. How do we do our job? How do we do it better? And and you know, as part of such a uh, <coughs> development program, we could include science education as part of that, and the importance of it to the economy. Uh, and so, I, you know, I, that's just a wild hair idea. I mean, I'm going to make one more comment. And you know, Mark stood up and asked his question. And I said earlier that one of the things that can help us as a transition is bridging support from industry. And 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 Mark. Uh, was Chief Technical Officer of Symantec, is now Chief Technical Officer of, of Newstar, but he's been one of those corporate executives in the Valley that has supported STEM education and, and done it with putting his, putting his money where his mouth is. Thank you, Mark, for what you do. We'll take uh, one last question. Looks like we have it over there. Hi, Congressman, I just wanted to thank you for taking time out to speak to us today. Um, my name is Judy Wang. I'm actually a recent graduate of the MIT Technology and Policy Program, and I grew up in the Bay Area and moved back home to pursue an opportunity in an early stage startup specializing in health IT. Um, my question actually is, what do you think the role of the government is in cultivating innovation and entrepreneurship? And on the flip side, what do you think our role as tech, um, tech innovators in the Valley is for keeping innovation and entrepreneurship in the public consciousness and pushing this agenda forward? Can I ask you a question first? Sure. What were you thinking when you were asking, formulated that question? It'll help me sort of respond. Um, so actually in March, I went to the South by Southwest conference and there was a lot of discussion around um, the Startup Act, the jobs bill, um, and Senator Jerry Moran was talking about um, pushing, pushing that through Congress. Um, and a lot of tech innovators were concerned about um, that there wasn't really a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship being pursued by the United States. And what is our role as young innovators in cultivating that and making sure it's okay, it's okay to tell graduates of places like MIT and like Stanford and Berkeley that it's okay to go into entrepreneurship um, and it's great to start your own business. And if your business fails, how do we make sure that they don't just decide not to start another business? Thank you. Um, you use the word innovation and um, a fellow by the name Cody Shimano said to me, Mike, you got to push teaching innovation. And I asked um, a CEO who retired, and who was one of the leaders in one of these st studies, national studies, so what do you think about teaching innovation? And he said, it's pretty hard. I mean, that's kind of innate. You know, how, do you, how do you take something that's in somebody else and, and, and teach that? Wow. He asked a, uh, a teacher, and I know how to do that. We put a bill together to say, you know, it's how do we teach? They put together a group that will extract skills and insights of people who have the highest amount of patents, go to them and try to extract those skills, and then turn them into teaching units uh, in terms of how you, how you can teach innovation. You know, and it can be fun. And I used to ask my science kids, so, what, what, how would life be different if your eyeballs were at the end of your index fingers? And once they got started, it was really hilarious. But they were starting to think outside the box. You know, you can't make your nose, you can't make your ears, your mom shakes her finger at you, she gets a headache, you know, all those kinds of things. But it's about teaching innovation and being an entrepreneur. I have my, my chief uh, ledge person He's a graduate from MIT, he's got a PhD, he taught, and his PhD was in material science. But it was his, it was his social consciousness that brought him to work in policy. So terms like democratization of energy became a theme in our office, trying to figure out how we get energy to every household in every home in the world because the sun is ubiquitous. And how do you convert that and drive innovation and drive, put monies into um, uh, thoughts and, uh, and, um, and research in that area so that we ultimately drive ourselves to a point where 
we're not dependent upon petroleum, but really become sustainable and self-sustaining on things that everybody can get access to. And so um, I, I think it's, it's a good thing to be that, because it's, it's that kind of thinking that drives other people to think beyond their own um, box that they've been taught in. You know, as we grow up, we're taught barriers. A child, when they're born, they're looking at everything, putting everything on, touching everything. And then as they grow older, we give them barriers. We say, no, 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 no. And pretty soon they grow up, you know, pretty much focused on certain kinds of things and not uh, looking at everything else. So um, I'm not sure that answers your question. But I, you know, I really want to push the concept of learning and innovation, but also consider what the hell happened in the past. When I talk about the Indians and the immigrants coming here, I'm serious. I'm talking about you know, the kinds of things that have driven our country to a point where global warming is not a problem. It's not a problem. Why? Because property, consumption, my stuff versus your stuff, power and control all become of the prominent rather than protecting the individuals. You know, the kinds of concepts that we have in our constitution, the kinds of things that you mentioned. So as policy makers, we really have to be the caretakers and the gatekeepers of um, people's rights and, and the consumers' rights. Let me just add that um, uh, in many parts of the country, uh, Working for established players is viewed as a prestige job for graduates um, of undergraduate, whereas here in Silicon Valley, I think that uh, working for startups is viewed as uh, the prestige job. Um, that you go to the incumbents if you couldn't get the job in a startup, whereas it's the vice versa in most parts of the country. Um, that's one of the reasons why uh, there's such a strong ethos here in Silicon Valley. Get the get the um, legislatures out of the way so they don't lock in the incumbents, uh, carry the room for the startups so that we can continue to have those jobs that we value as, uh, as graduates. Um, but we are out of time, and uh, I do want to thank all of you for coming and uh, joining us uh, today. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the State Net West program is our flagship event um, uh, that we uh, have throughout the year, so we do hope you'll come and join us at some of the other offerings. I want to thank uh, Dana Dipmore uh, for uh, joining us here. I also want to thank Rev. Hanna for taking this valuable time, and uh, for our staff to come in and help uh, put this event together. Uh, we're very grateful to have opportunities to share uh, time uh, with Reverend Honda and have him back on campus. Um, so thank you very much for coming today.